The production of urea is basically taking a nitrogen from ammonium ion, a carbon from bicarbonate, and a nitrogen from aspartate, and forming a, nitro a, a double nitrogenous compound known as urea. The first step is the primary site of regulation, so an ammonium ion condenses with bicarbonate at the expense of two ATPs to form carbamoyl phosphate. And this, so this step is the primary control step. If you're going to stop or upregulate the process, you do it right here. And then carb carbamoyl phosphate, sorry, carbamoyl phosphate is condensed with ornithine to form citrulline. Uh, then the second nitrogen is added in here uh, from aspartate, and you go through the cycle uh, forming arginine in the process and making urea as the end goal. So the first step in urea production is the condensation of, uh, of ammonia with bicarbonate through carbamoyl phosphatase, phosphate synthetase 1, CPS1. And this is at the expense of two ATPs to form carbamoyl phosphate. There is a carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 2 that, that can be found outside of the liver, and it's used to produce pyrimidines. Now, carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1, CPS1, is allosterically activated by N-acetylglutamate, and this is also called NAG, N-A-G. If NAG or N-acetylglutamate is low, then carbon, uh, CPS1's activity is extremely slow, and so you don't have a whole lot of carbamoyl phosphate being generated. But when you add NAG, it activates it, and this process goes much faster. Now, CPS1 is a mitochondrial enzyme, so the first step takes place in the mitochondria. So the... Incorporation of ammonia with bicarb occurs in the mitochondria, but the production of N-acetylglutamate also occurs in the mitochondria. So N-acetylglutamate, or NAG, is a combination of taking acetyl-CoA and glutamate and combining it together to form N-acetylglutamate. It happens through N-acetylglutamate synthetase. Now, acetyl-CoA is a signal saying, hey, this cell has enough energy, and glutamate is saying, hey, this cell has excess nitrogen. Arginine is an activator for N-acetylglutamate synthetase and saying that it's an indicator saying that the urea cycle is ready to go. It's up and ready to go. And so we form N-acetylglutamate. The only purpose of N-acetylglutamate is to activate that first reaction, the, the um, combination of ammonium ion with bicarb to form the carbamoyl phosphate. And so all it's doing is saying, hey, everything is ready to go. All of the precursors of the urea cycle are ready to go, and we have enough of everything, so let's make some urea. The half-life of uh, NAG is about 20 minutes to an hour. It gets transferred out into the cytosol and degraded. And so one of the things that you need to note here are if you want the urea cycle to run, you have to have glutamate and you have to have acetyl-CoA. If you don't have acetyl-CoA, the urea cycle will not run. And so remember, where does acetyl-CoA come from? So let's uh, talk about this really quick. You get acetyl-CoA from uh, glycolysis. You get acetyl-CoA from beta-oxidation. So beta-oxidation of fats. And you get acetyl-CoA from the breakdown of uh, ketogenic, ketogenic uh, amino acids. And these things are primarily broken down for energy. And so if your body doesn't have enough energy, you're not going to have enough acetyl-CoA. And if you don't have enough acetyl-CoA, you're not going to make urea. And so we had ammonia and uh, we had um, the a bicarb coming together at the expense of two ATPs to form carbamoyl phosphate that happens in the mitochondria and then ornithine transcarbamylase uh, will 
combine uh, carbon monophosphate with ornithine to produce citrulline. This also happens in the mitochondria. After that, the citrulline is exported to the cytosol and the rest of the reaction occurs in the cytosol. And let's talk through the, the cycle really quickly, uh, not focusing on any particular thing, but the citrulline gets combined with aspartate uh, using arginine, arginosusinate synthetase. It uses up an ATP and you get uh, arginosusinate. And so arginosusinate goes uh, through the action of arginosusinate lyase, uh, forms arginine. Now in the process of that, you also get fumarate, which can go back into the TCA cycle, or it can go into gluconeogenesis, or you can get aspartate. And those aren't just necessarily single reactions, but the fumarate feeds into many things. Uh, it's, an, it's a TCA intermediate. Now the breakdown of arginine reforms the ornithine that you started with and produces urea. So the very last step in the pathway before urea is actually formed is arginine. And so it's saying, hey, we have enough. We got plenty of nitrogen. We need to get rid of some. And so you remember back, arginine is a, uh, stimulates NAG, N-acetylglutamate uh, synthetase. But arginine can also stimulate the production of additional ornithine, uh, ornithine be, uh, over and beyond what it's actually producing in the breakdown. So arginine can say, hey, we need more ornithine. We're getting backed up here. And so it'll actually enhance the production of additional ornithine to enhance the cycle. So remember, uh, aspartate enters the cycle and it costs an ATP. It costs an ATP to form arginine so this is a condensation reaction where we're condensing citrulline with aspartate and it's catalyzed by arginine synthetase. And you can kind of see from the picture exactly what's happening. So this is my amino group and here's the amino group from citrulline and in the final product here's the amino group from citrulline Here's the amino group from aspartate. So this basically attaches right here. We're breaking this uh, this carbonyl bond and we're forming an, I, I believe it's an amide bond. Of course my organic chemistry is about uh, about six or seven months old on this so I don't want to be quoted on that. The point is to look and notice that this is the new the new connection is aspartate to citrulline. So from arginine susinate, arginine susinate lyase will produce arginine which is an amino acid and then arginase will act arginase will act upon arginine form, reforming ornithine that started the cycle and forming urea so note if you get a lot of arginine in your diet then uh, arginase will act on that and you'll form excess ornithine which will enhance the urea cycle in the kidneys, the enzyme arginase is absent. And so in the kidneys, you can actually form arginine at slow, small amounts for the use in your body. But it's so slow that if you're growing or if you're in a disease state, the amount of arginine that you're making isn't enough. And so it becomes a conditionally essential amino acid. Also notice again that uh, in, the, in the lyase reaction, Fumarate is released, which is a TCA intermediate, so it can go back in uh, to the TCA cycle for gluconeogenesis and that kind of thing. So by that fumarate going back into the TCA cycle, it minimizes the energy required to run the urea cycle. So even though it costs two ATPs in the beginning, so it costs two ATPs to condense NH3 and HC, uh, HCO3. So two ATPs to form carbamoyl phosphate. So I'm just going to put carb phos, carbamoyl phosphate. And it also costs an acetyl CoA, acetyl CoA to, to form NAG, N acetyl glutamate. And so it costs energy to run the urea cycle, but notice that by the production of fumarate, we get a little bit of that back. And the other great thing is that this is taking place, urea production takes place in the liver, 
And so because it's in the liver and the liver is primarily responsible for uh, gluconeogenesis, fumarate comes into the TCA cycle after carboxylation. So it can actually contribute carbons to gluconeogenesis.